Welcome, friends. Lost Guy here, and we're having basically a podcast with the uh, shoutcaster, Verbalocity. Hi, it's the first time you see my face on here. I've been on here yeah. once or twice now, but it's actually the first time I'm in this box now. A rather huge box, so <laughs> hi. Mm-hmm. And we can see you have Assassin's Creed in the background. Yes, I am a bit of an Assassin's Creed mark. And Halo? So, yeah, Halo Wars, actually. An old Halo Wars Ooh. poster. Don't question the fairy lights, I'm too lazy to take that down. <laughs> so you got those, and you have... That That's is a Gears, Gears of War, War. Yep. limited edition 360. Yeah, I spent way go. too much on Gears of War 3 when it came out. I didn't realize it would be a room inspection. <laughs> <laughs> the realization was, uh, it became a room inspection. So the first oh part of basically the podcast, whenever it's the new person, it is introduction. And though viewers have seen, well, heard verbal quite a few times, you're seeing it for the first time, and in this podcast format, so since the first time, what is Verbalocity all about? I am primarily a commentator for esports, but I do very occasional streams. I am not frequent. I don't do, like, daily uploads like yourself. I just do, like, very infrequent streams whenever I feel like it, but mainly a shoutcaster in currently Smite and For Honor. Those are my main scenes. And I gotta mention, For Honor was is your jam. You were second or first for a long time in that. It, that was in the bed. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Honestly, at this point, I'm more concerned that For Honor might be on its last legs, but that's a whole different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. We could talk about that. Well, what? Okay, okay. Mm. I'm now. I'm curious. What do you? Why do you think that about For Honor? Yeah. Well, open with that. So first of all, well, like opening, open a drink. But <laughs> the. For Honor. It's in an interesting place. We actually left off on For Honor last time we talked. <laughs> so, For Honor right now, it's not in the greatest place. If you, they won't reveal player numbers, but it's very obvious player numbers are down. Game, to, as someone who plays a lot of For Honor, game queues in certain modes don't exist at certain times. Ooh. And you will often just run into the same people over and over and over again. Now, I'm not sure if that's a matchmaking thing, or if that is a, just a, like a low player amount thing. But For Honor is also gaining a negative reputation to it very much because of a lot of problems with the game. First problem that everyone probably knows about already, but I'll reiterate. The game's networking solution isn't fantastic. It uses a simulation. And I put that in heavy <laughs> quotation marks. Because they, the primary mode that everyone knows about is the Dominion mode. It's the one where it's 4v4, tons of minions, it's an all-out siege kind of thing. So yeah. it's, Domin it's Dominion with a middling, essentially. And what ends up happening is uh, they want to keep things as robust as a fighting game, but with d over 200 other entities running about. So the way they figured it out was, from what they've talked about, is they make everyone in the game, all the players, host and yeah. client at the same time. At the same time, though? At the same time. Huh. Now, I guess that's to relieve stress and keep things fair, so there's no host advantage. But, I know there's, of course, there's other parts of this I won't know of, but that's what I know. But the problem is, let's say there's four of me, four of Scarf. <laughs> and we're all playing, you know, doing honor, probably getting our heads cut off. One of Scarf's clones buggers off. What happens? The game has to go, all right, stop, everyone, stop. Okay, uh, everyone else, take up the slack. Are we all good? Uh, put a bot in there and go. Oh. Now, there's a key flaw with that system because if someone at Rage quits out, the game's got to stop. And it already, with one person leaves, has a nasty habit of just collapsing the entire game. Oh. But if someone gets annoyed with that and say, okay, I'm done with this, one of Verb's clones is leaving, now the game's got to go, stop again, two of you now need to be accounted for, got to, like, patch everything up, go. Mm. And then it gets worse and worse, and eventually the entire system collapses. This is why rage quitting is so looked down upon in For Honor, because it will collapse matches so easily. Oh. And that's not even getting into easy anti-cheat. That's a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> it's so easy to get booted. Like, um, side note, Smite now has easy anti-cheat. A lot of games are getting easy anti-cheat, I'm seeing. Huh, okay. Hmm. I don't I don't think of that. I I hate anti-cheats, because what they do is, if you have a lower-end computer, it tanks your performance so bad you can't even play a game anymore. That kicked me out of a game I really loved back in the day. I know that. Which was? Uh, I was called, like, Full Metal or Metal Assault. I think it was called Metal Assault. And this was a really, really fun, like, 2D shooter. Where you Metal could aim Assault. Yeah, and you could aim your mouse. It's a dead game now, unfortunately. It did go on Skype for a, on, on Steam for a while. Play Metal Assault. Yeah, I'm seeing it now, actually. I just yeah. looked it up. And 
it was one of my favorite games ever. I played it way too much. I was really good at rolling people in that game. I enjoyed it a lot. But I once the antic sheet came in, I was lagging all the time. I think it was more performance lag. So I just couldn't play the game anymore. And so I kind of hate anti cheats as long as mm -hmm. as far as lower end goes. When you're high end, you don't really care. It's not going to affect your performance probably. You might be concerned for other things like uh BDO, Black Desert Online. They have like an anti cheat thing that is looking at the last 48 hours that you've been doing on your computer. And that feels what, way the too entire invasive. Thing. Yeah. It's like what have you been doing Ooh. for the last 48 hours? It's very invasive. I'm like, okay, I'm not for that. And right. it's kind of a pain. Kind of like a of punk it. buster. It's kind of like punk buster though. Yeah. And punk it's a pain is a in the similar butt. thing. You uh we had to go into like what's it called? Uh start commands? Or let's I can't you remember. Had to go the right to command word. Line? You had to go to command line to remove it. Like <laughs> really? getting rid of the game doesn't get rid of it. Ooh. Their claim though is it only activates when the game's on. But it's like, are you kidding me with this? And so DRM man. Yeah. I, it, I don't it like it. It almost turns into DRM, the anti cheat, just by being that invasive. Yeah. Like it's there in your system and it like you said, it stays some some anti cheat stays after you wipe the game away, so that can get quite annoying. But Honor itself, it does have some of those issues. It might be related to drivers, we don't know, but in oh. general, For Honor does have that issue of networking. It also, as someone who casts it a lot, I hate casting For Honor right now because one, there's no proper spectator mode. So you've got to do kind of this gimmicky thing where if you want to do a one versus one duel, got to set up a two versus two if you've got two <laughs> casters. Oh. And then every time you do a new round, the players have to kill off the casters. And then you go into death cam, and that's where you actually commentate from. So it's really annoying. So there's no way to just go, oh, it's not like, say, Smite or any other game with a spectator where you just go, type a command, join lobby, spectator, go. Okay. So that can get pretty annoying. Plus, the game itself is very defense heavy, so much so that a good few classes in the game can be defeated by simply doing four things, blocking in three directions and pressing counter guard break at the correct time. So it huh. ends up literally just being a ginormous staring contest the entire time. And it gets dull as dishwater. You know, no one wants to watch that. The funny thing about that is that's how real combat works for between masters. Mm. That's the funny thing. They wanted to base it around that. They talked about, like, uh, Roman, the, the new creative director on it, mm. talked about how they want to make it defense-oriented. But y the, it's a video game, so it, there yeah. has to be a byline. And a lot of people, or a lot of characters in that, um, don't have good opening moves. Uh. They ha don't have a way of getting through your guard, because you guard in three directions. But some moves, like the Warlord, for instance, he can headbutt you. That just stuns you. He gets a free move off that, guaranteed. Yeah. That, that actually makes things interesting because it forces pressure. But things like, say, the Kensei, my personal main, he doesn't have an opener like that. He has to physically slip around your guard, which, against someone who's competent, is not happening. Yeah. So things just get boring. It's realistic, <laughs> but not good for a video game and not good for esports in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, like, if there's one thing you learn is, even if you're a huge fan of any sport... It's all about scoring. It is always about scoring. Like, the only, the only sport where it's not always about... Well, no, no, it's always about scoring. It's the journey a little bit, but even in football, like soccer football, it's one of the lowest scoring games. People lose their absolute mind when at least one goal happens in a one game. But all the people fights. love scoring. Always about the fights. Any and sport. the fights. Yeah. Everyone has a good fight. People love scoring. That's the one thing. They love scoring. They'll, they'll lose their crap every time. And so, if it's just a defensive game, it's not as interesting. And, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not so great. It's not so great. Tell you what, though, Scarf, yeah. I've got to ask you. So, you and I, a little while back, played some Fran, and we posted it on your channel. Yeah. What were your initial impressions then? Because this was during the beta, I think, we played. Uh, we... So, what, what was your impressions of it then? I think we played beta. No, we played beta and then we played uh, post release. release. Yeah. Hmm. Beta, I loved it. Post release, I didn't love it as much because I got a little bit more time with it. And I know I was pretty down on the game. It was a lot of you defending the game against me. Hmm. And it was a defensive game and it was a bit annoying about that. But it was also any, any 
touch of lag in that game was really frustrating to deal with, for sure. And it's it's the problem with a game like that. A game that relies on frames, every frame being important, any bit of lag is going to be annoying, especially if you understand that. Mm. And, like, I like the game on a casual level, but when you get technical deeper into it, I don't like it as much, that's for sure. That's the thing I've I've observed with For Honor. The best time you can have in For Honor is casual to mid-level play, mm. when you can actually do moves, make mistakes, and get things in. High level, it turns into... <laughs> small punch small punch Ooh. move to the side a bit that's it so that can be a giant issue but it's good to hear that you had fun at a casual level mm. because that's where most people have their fun yeah you can that argue game. that's how it is with any game you could definitely argue that like at the casual level people have a lot of fun and at the high level it's whether or not you can appreciate the high level i think like there are there are a good couple of games that where high level stuff can be extremely entertaining. Dark Souls. Hmm. Dark Souls high level is so much fun to play. I've only ever done it once. I fought against someone who was a high level once, but that made my heart go about two hundred beats per <laughs> second. Oh. And and watching a high level is enthralling. Oh, like yeah. be, like a key is being able to watch it now as well, especially in this age of like Twitch and YouTube and Mixer and all that stuff. <laughs> Mixer. <laughs> but being able to watch it more importantly. We'll talk about streaming service in a second, because I have a point on that. Okay. But in general, for Honor, the community has done as much as it can. They've, they've, we've thrown fits over doing blackouts and whiteouts and like all these protests and all this weird bomb, like, bombastic stuff. And it's now just like, okay, devs, patch the game, get it fixed, add more stuff, balance your characters. I haven't even talked about the balancing. I'm leaving that out because that's an entire kettle of fish. Then this isn't a for on podcast. This is basically a podcast. <laughs> yes, and it's and then hopefully it's on it's on for Ubisoft to actually fix it. Now, Scuff, I wanted to talk to you about the streaming because we had a big bit of semi breaking news, I'd say, and this is more pertinent to you because you stream and make content way more than I do. Yeah, affiliates on Twitch now can get subs. Yeah, that is that's huge. I did not imagine that was going to be a thing. I like, why do I even need to be a, a partner anymore? Becomes the question. That's I'm I'm guessing mm. there's more protection you maybe get as a partner or something. There's a list. I, there's oh. a list. I'm going to try and pull it up. Uh, Twitch tweeted it. Twitter. Oh, okay. Basically, you get a way better. Sp uh, they didn't talk about it on the list, but you get a way better split on the revenue as a partner oh. versus being a obviously a part of them being an affiliate. You only get one emote. Huh, okay. You get uh, your payout for pay is 45 days as a partner versus 60 as an affiliate. Okay. Uh, where is this bloody list? I didn't know there was a list. All I heard about was the, the affiliate subs. Shoot. Maybe it's on the, uh, the Twitch uh, subreddit. But basically, there's a, there's a lot more benefits to being a partner, but it brings up a good point that you mentioned. What's the Why aim for partner when yeah. you can just be an affiliate? So I'm wondering that I like I I thought it's still developing because I know they said in a couple of days they'll announce everything because we're like the day after they announced it basically, and I figured they were still hashing it out. But oh, if there's more information, I should check it out. But yeah, we we can get at least one emote. That'll be fun. Uh, mm. I was thinking we just get a sub button. Okay, all right, which uh, is interesting. Just being able to have subs because we've had viewers who've wanted to sub for a very very long time and so they'll be happy to know they can finally sub and i'm excited to actually get to play with emotes and stuff so i'm really curious what the things are when it comes to partners oh you had something or? yes i found the list i found okay, the full okay. thing i want to hear this here's the pertinent bits so all streamers can't cheer with bits twitch affiliates can receive bits they can be cheered which is a big thing but they can't do the custom cheer emotes Oh. Partners can. So, like the animated ones where, like, you can huh. do like Craigasm and then like stupid <laughs> Craigasm and then Craigasm go into the fourth dimension. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, subscriptions. You can get subs, of course. That was just announced. But you only get one amount, just the one. Just one. Okay. Yes. And then partners can get up to 50. Also, okay. random side note. Whoever right now is in the business of making emotes, you're about to make a fortune. Yes. Jump on this right now. Oh my god, yes. I, I only know of one person. Like, it's the one that uh, Mez gets all of his from. Uh, Chiwa, I think, or, or her? Hannah, I think her name is something. Hannah 2T? I think so. Like, I can't remember their name exactly or... right now. But yeah. they do all of his emotes. And they're going to make a lot of money right now. Holy crap. 
Yeah, like people are getting fully booked up. I'm seeing it on Twitter. Yeah. Like there are artists like, guys, stop asking me. I've already got all <laughs> orders. This is a go- this is an affiliate gold rush right now for both affiliates and emote makers. Yeah, it's a it's a nice time for them and it's where they can go from there, especially because if it's just affiliates. So uh, it, affiliates is a lot lower ground to get to than partner is. And it's just crazy. It is crazy that affiliates a thing in the way it is. And I don't know. I don't feel as pressed to get partner because partner is such a pain in the butt to get. I, I have complaints, but I don't need to, to share them. Yeah. The final couple of pun details actually to discuss. Okay. Um, Past broadcast storage is still 14 days, so say if you get a, your channel, my channel, you'll suddenly get the 14 days versus 60 for a partner. Yeah. Uh, you can do game sales on your channel. You'll get access to that. Oh. So below the channel, you can buy the game you're playing through nice. Twitch and get the share of the revenue. I imagine it's a small share. It doesn't say on the list. Um, there's chargeback protection, oh, which is huge. That is huge. Holy crap. Okay. So, of course, that comes with bits by default, but still, bits... Chargeback protection, that may cause people to not want to take tips, but no one's going to do that. Yeah. And then the final bit, which is about the money that they list, the only thing, the payout fees for receiving money every 60 to 45 days, the affiliate covers the fees versus the partner, Ooh. Twitch covers the fees for you. Oh. So that could be a nasty sting on someone if they're expecting, yeah, it comes to pay the equipment job. What do you mean <laughs> I just make 25 bucks? What do you mean that was a 20% payout fee? Ooh, wow, they making the money off, yeah? Ooh. Well, mm. it is an affiliate program after all, and... Yeah, not full partner. So you'd still take what you can get, but who? Yeah, you want partner for that for sure, because you get a bigger payout out of it. But if you're an affiliate and you get bank happening when you're an affiliate, you're becoming a partner pretty dang quick. That's... You're that's also broke to it. Yeah. So... Still, you, you are getting a chunk, but Twitch is getting a bigger chunk than if you were a partner, I would assume. Huh, alright. But then again, when you're a partner, you're bringing in a lot more than the affiliate should be bringing in. So, yeah, they're still making a point. lot. Yeah, like, you can mathematically go over how many subs they need or something out of you for it to be more more beneficial for you as a as A, a better business partner. arrangement. Yeah, yeah. pretty much, because it's all about money. I wonder, though, what, why was this announcement causing so much vitriolic hate over Twitter? There was, it felt like, I imagine you saw this a bit when, when, it was on, when it was on Twitter, when it was originally announced, but I was watching it live. Really? There was a, it felt like a war going on between three sides. Okay. Affiliates, partners, and people who aren't any of those two. <laughs> people were like the affiliates are saying like yeah this is awesome for us we can actually you know get get subs now it's fantastic yeah some partners were like yeah if we host someone we can try and encourage them to get subs now which is great yeah some other partners were like hey you're stealing off our revenue go away your you, affi more affiliates being around means that it means less money in the pool for us that was their quote not mine and then there's people on the outside just like okay cool fine and I can understand the points from both ends of the argument. I have opinions on both, but I want to get yours first. I think it's how big you see the pool. It really is how big the forest is, in your opinion. Because it's not a zero-sum game. It's never been a zero-sum game. If you think it's a zero-sum game, you are a zero-sum. Because, holy crap, that's... No, it's not a zero-sum game. There are audiences everywhere. There's people everywhere. You just haven't reached them yet. Plenty of people have money, plenty of people don't have money as well, but they want to support. There's a lot of people out there. It's not like there's only 10 people who watch this thing, I want all 10 of them. Like, there are tons of people. If you lose someone to someone else, you're going to gain someone else later on. Just be that good, I think. I really mm. don't, I don't, it's not zero sum. It's not zero sum in any way. In artistry, in music, in anything, it's not zero sum. There's a lot of people out there who want to devour your work. And anyone you lose, someone else will replace it. I don't, I don't get this thought of, oh, partners can take everything. Oh, wait. I mean, affiliates can take everything from partners. No way. Even if I was a partner right now, I'm not going to think affiliates are biting into my stuff at all. I'm happy for them. All I've gotten is positivity. I'm like, I, people who are affiliates can get subs now. That's great because there's people who want to support certain people. Maybe they'll never get big. Maybe they'll always be the small number. They have this close community because some streamers prefer it that way. They only want a small community. 
and they can get supported by this what however many subs they get as an affiliate now. And so I don't get that. I feel like that is more of a problem of not understanding how wide how vast the audience can be. I really think it's more of a not understanding supply and only thinking about demand. Hmm. Or the other I'm, I've been trying in my head to perform the mental gymnastics required to become devil's advocate in this argument, and I'm going to try and give it a bash, okay. but it's going to fall apart fast. <laughs> so, let's say I'm a partner. I've got, a, I've got an audience, but my, I don't have a dance game level of emote game. Like, my emotes aren't known throughout the site. My community isn't as hardcore as a soda poppin' or a lyric or a nitby JP. I'm there, I've got partner, but I haven't got my claws in. You know, I'm still holding onto the wall, haven't got my hooks in. If, say, other people start coming along and they do little bits, it's not all of my money's gone, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's, oh, I'm sorry, man, I couldn't afford my sub because of X, Y, or Z reason when really wanted to go sub to this affiliate X. Then this guy goes to affiliate Y, then this person goes to Z, and all, all, all of a sudden I've lost 20 to 50% of my stuff. Okay. Now, of course, like you said, it comes back to the whole, it's not a zero-sum game. People can go back and forth. It's not, once you're locked out of subbing to someone else, you can't come back. I swap hot swap subs all the time. And especially with Twitch Prime being a thing, and the amount that Twitch Prime free subs are already bought for, which in of, in of itself, that's actually one of the biggest uh, negatives people are talking about. It's like, they're arguing all of my Twitch Prime subs are going to be gone now. They're going to go to affiliates because people are going to feel... Now, this is the words I saw from one, I'm not going to name them, partner. They said, all of my Twitch Prime subs, or a good chunk of them, are going to go to affiliate streamers because people feel sorry for them and will give them the free sub instead of me. Because that streamer cons thought about Prime subs going to him as, oh, it's a convenience thing. You can sub to me with just two button clicks. I get money, you get emotes, happy days. But with an actual money monetary sub, you've got to go through all the process. It's more steps. But when things are more easier, it's a lot more easier to slip into, oh, I'll just give it to you. Or I'll just give it to you. I think that was the logic in that thinking. Does that sound right? Uh, I, I, I think I get it. Because, yeah, the, the less barriers there are, the more you're likely to throw something out there. So mm. I get that argument. But how do you know how many primes you got and can't prove a negative you know that you know yeah. in your acumenic percentage you can't prove a negative so uh, i get the argument they're trying to make and maybe it is a valid one but i don't know how well you can really prove that one like you can't really know as far as i could think unless you actually can see the numbers on that and then we would find out in post but I don't know if that is the only mindset someone who has Prime's gonna have is like, I'll just give them the free one. All right, I'll just give it to this person. I'll give it to that person. But at the end of the day, it's up to them what they want to do with it. What they want to do with their sub is what they want to do with their sub. Yeah. And I get the stress of it because obviously, if you want to make this as a living, every analytical bit matters. Every number matters, and you want to get that. But I don't know. At, at the end of the day, I. Twitch is growing. There's the audience is getting bigger. There's more and more people showing up. I I really do believe you can pick up whatever you've lost. Like if you're if you're good at what you're doing, you you're already there, bringing up those numbers and everything. You can pick up what you've lost. I don't. I get why there would be stress about it, but I don't see the problem with giving more people the chance to grow, as a community all around. And as a as a, an additional point to there. I saw a tweet which was a very apt one, and it simply said, if you're scared that your audience is going to be drained by subs to affiliates, how solid was your viewer base in the first place? Oh, I should have known that, it, that someone would make a comment. That's true. It is true. It's like, if you're worried, then how good is your base? It's like, yeah, you can make that, you can make that argument. But part of it is for sure someone... People are just being a little paranoid, for sure. Because you're, you're worrying mm. about everything. You're worrying about your livelihood and everything. And that, that, is, the, that is a knife. That is a, quite the stab to make at someone when you, with that comment, for sure. But uh, I don't know. 
I I think of, I think it was a positive thing more so than a negative, but time will tell on that one for sure. That at the end of the day, time will tell. But I just see it as a positive. Just gives more people a chance to get something out of it monetarily, I suppose. Like it Yeah. It is viewers getting to help out people who are affiliates that they've wanted to help out. Like from my spot it is there's people who wanted to help me out and they're getting chances. They got Patreon to do it, they've got Ted to do it, they've got uh the bits to do it Tad. now because the affiliate. Yeah. Like, Tad bits, Patreon, uh donations in general, um now subs. So there's just more and more ways to help someone out, to help someone that you be- that you believe in or you enjoy watching. And that's not a bad thing, I don't think. It's just another revenue stream happening that people can do. I don't know. I I can, I just see it as a positive. I don't see it as a negative, but that's cuz I'm climbing up, not not at the top already. Now when you're up there, that is the question. And I'm trying to see that argument there is yeah, the the free sub argument, like maybe they go somewhere else, I'm going to lose people. But if you're already up there, it's not just about maintaining, you can always still grow when you're up there. So it's always about growth at the end of the day. I don't and I don't know. and then the growth for some of the bigger guys doesn't necessarily always come from you it's no longer just subs other doors open up for you 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 diversify your revenue you get sponsor deals sponsor yeah. streams that's huge merchandise appearances this that and a third yeah like... so it's not just subs subs are the core of a streamer's income apart from the big bursts that come from sponsorships like you know 20 30 grand yeah but still yeah, the this is own this only pushes everyone up. Yeah, it 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 definitely pushes everyone up. That's that's for sure. So I don't because okay, the roadmap of a YouTuber and a streamer of a content creator. The roadmap of that is you're at the start, you got nothing. Random people watch your stuff and then they like it, they stick around, and it trickles up, trickles up. You're slowly climbing up there. You're getting your sub count up. You're getting your follower count up. You're getting regular viewers. And you're looking for revenue streams to keep you going. It's not going to be to make a living, but it's to make money to, so that you can afford things to try to climb up even further. Make upgrades or to buy games or to buy equipment. To just whatever you need to do to keep going. Or maybe you can also use that for giveaways and such. And you're climbing up. You climb up and there's a point where it's different for everyone where eventually those sponsorships happen. Maybe some little ones here and there. I've got a mouse from Mio. I've got just a mouse from Mio. <laughs> I've only had one sponsorship. <laughs> but um... you need the hot Nintendo sponsorship for a new plushy wall to slowly grow oh, in the back. God. Like yeah. the wall's been kind of static, I'll be honest. It's been, <laughs> it had a good growth for a while, but your wall game's been slacking with. Yes, like, yes, yes. It needs to grow at least a couple more plushies. That would be glorious. Oh, oh, just get just get a, a sponsorship from a plushy company. Oh my god. <laughs> Every every stream is like, ah, here's a new plush, huh? You would go huh? insane. Huh? Oh my god, it'd be amazing because plushies like I would have the I would have perfect sound, uh, sound quality with with more <laughs> you plushies. Make a sound booth out of a tower of plushies. <laughs> That's the dream. All that of would a make the camera horrifying though. It's like, <laughs> Welcome, friends. It's Loskov here, and it's just eyes everywhere. <laughs> it's oh god. Oh, that would be glorious. That would that'd be absolutely glorious. Like. Just walls and walls of whatever. Hopefully just Kirby's. But it'd be great. Or you get an Amiibo sponsorship. It's like, every Amiibo's in the back, guys. Holy crap. Hmm. It would be glorious. But you do get a point where you got sponsorships. Or you're able to talk to companies for things. Like, I'm at the point where I, I'm big enough that I can talk to indies. I'm like, all right, I want to cover your game. It's like, okay, here's your game. Here's the game. And it's like, hmm. awesome. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes it does. And I'm going to rely on that count and the viewership and everything. With this podcast, like, hey, hey, I have this much this and this much that. You want to come on? Let me ask you some questions. Maybe have some fun. Maybe not have some fun. We'll find out. But be like a first date every time. <laughs> and see how it goes. But um, re- you rely on your numbers for a for a kind of clout in a way. But it's, it's mm. always about climbing up and you... Un- in a way, it's like gaming. You unlock new things as you climb up, and new opportunities show up. You're big enough for sponsorships. You're big enough for this or that. 
And I don't know, this is just, I feel like the affiliate program is a way to allow those at the bottom to climb up a little bit faster in a way, because they have more money access. And they also have viewers who feel like, well, they're helping out. Because when viewers feel invested in some way, well, then, while they're invested, they'll stick with you and they'll be more supportive and such like that. So I only see it as a positive. That leads on to a good point, though. So I, while you were talking about the Kirbys, my mind wandered off. You probably <laughs> saw me looking at the screen. Yeah. I was trying to do two things. One, I was looking at how many like plushies you can actually bulk buy. And two... <laughs> I was thinking about the new console that was console that, that was announced by Nintendo. Ah. The Super Nintendo Mini or Ye Super Nintendo Classic. Yes. Yes. The question is have they learned their lesson from Nintendo because from NES because that sold out like woo -hoo -hoo -hoo, and they didn't make I've more. got words on that. I I'm actually annoyed at Nintendo because they deliberately understock that stuff. Yeah. And the statement that they made with the release of this, or the announcement of the Super Nintendo Classic, they do not like doing this stuff. They are, they obviously don't like doing. They are doing this to platitude the hardcore few that want to do this. They want to rely on the sales of the Switch and the 3DS as their hardcore source of income. Like, it's got some. This is some hardcore stuff being announced in this. This is for a, a niche audience. Like. An, un an unmade, unreleased game is being released with this, Star Fox 2. Ooh, yeah. Yes, like, a game is. that was previously not out on the ROMs. And recently, the actual development team had a party because they recently <laughs> released the game finally on this thing. Yeah. Yeah, but all of this stuff, like, let me find the full list, but uh, you could probably attest to it. Having easy, legal access to some old Super Nintendo games would flip the entire thing on its head. Yeah, uh, access to ROMs is not hard to do at all, and people would like to actually just own the thing and play it. You get the old Super Nintendo controllers. I could just whip out my Super Nintendo and just play my Super Nintendo right now. And it was like, oh, this feels great, but having that classic? Holy crap. I don't understand, and it's like, why does Nintendo hate money? Why does mm. Nintendo hate money so much is a weird question, because... There were a ton of people who still wanted the NES Classic. That was a moneymaker that they... We're not willing to work with. And the Super Nintendo, that's another moneymaker that they're not, they don't want to do. And it's such a weird idea. And no one could understand it. No one understands this because the argument was if the virtual console for the Switch had that library, no one could stop them. And it's a question of why don't the they're not willing to. The Netflix of retro yes. would be born. No one could stop Nintendo, and someone's, everyone's wondering, why does Nintendo not want to do it? it everyone calls it a freaking goldmine. You have a bunch of popular, uh, 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 popular entities who believe in that as well. I don't know anyone who's, who's argued against it that has a compelling argument. It's just Nintendo just doesn't want to do it, as far as anyone knows. Mm. I don't get it. Like, even for the cost of infrastructure or like servers or whatever it is, a lot of people want to just play the classics. There's a lot of nostalgia there. Nintendo has always dominated through nostalgia. They've done a great job of that. And they don't want to take advantage of it. They're, like, scared that people won't be nostalgic anymore. That right there is the counter-argument to that that I've heard. The, mm. to play, I'm playing Devil's Advocate on here for some reason. <laughs> but, yeah, the evil British guy. The, hey. That old stereotype. But Top hat. the counter-argument I've heard to... <laughs> the counter-argument <laughs> to the... Like the Netflix of retro that has been coined is what happens to nostalgia when you're overexposed to it? It just be becomes meh. And there's a, like you said, mm. Nintendo dominates on nostalgia. What happens when the nostalgia becomes on demand? It just turns into old games. So mm. they deliberately keep that stuff back, make you gag for it, make you froth the mouth for it. And when they announce, oh, a new Metroid, or a new this, on a new system that they can make more money for, bam, you jump right on it. It's why they constantly mm. undersell Amiibos, undersell consoles. Nintendo love underselling stuff to make you want it more. They, pardon my French, but they are the cock teasers of the game industry. <laughs> they will just make you want it more and more and more by constantly oh. underselling you on it. You are correct on that one. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that argument. I can definitely see that argument. Is that... The Wii, 
the Wii was the most selling console of all time, I think. It passed the PlayStation 2. Yeah. And that thing kept selling out in, like, my local game and all around town and everywhere around the world. It was just constantly sold out, sold out, sold out. Yeah, it destroyed everything. Nintendo did a great service for gaming in general when they did that. You got hardcores who don't like that, it brought in a lot of casuals, but it brought in all the casuals who became hardcore as well. The Wii was an amazing thing. But this nostalgia argument, that is an interesting argument. I, I can see where that might be true. Other parts of it are like, I don't know as well, because it doesn't take a lot of effort to get those damn realms either, so I don't know. I really, but, but, okay, from my perspective, ROMs are not hard to get. They're just there, and when I was in high school, I played every SNES game I could find that I did not own. Like, sometimes I just had to get the Japanese translations because they were games that you can't even get here, like Fire Emblem or some of the other RPGs. And I consumed massive amounts of Super Nintendo, either by owning it or through ROMs. Same thing goes for Sega. And so I've played them all, I enjoyed them all, but that's in the past though. But you could easily just get the ROMs now and play them if you really want, but people want to legally own them as well. They want to be able to play them. Yes. ROMs are such a grey area. Like, here in the UK, there's kind of a semi-law, a semi-precedent, where if you own the game, physically, you can emulate it, fine. Yeah. But even there are some games that have some online elements where, online elements where people have been done in on them in the past. Like, here is, here's the full lineup of games, for those of you listening or watching, mm. yeah. and can't be asked to look up the list yourself. Good thing to do. Contra 3, The Alien Wars, Donkey Kong Country, Earthbound, some other two, Final Fantasy 3, F-Zero, Kirby Superstar, way, Kirby's Dream Course, way, Le Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, Mega Man X, Secret of Mana, Star Fox, Star Fox 2, that's the unreleased one, oh, yeah. Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting, <laughs> which is interesting because that's coming out on the Switch, Ooh. Super Super Castlevania 4, that's 4, I can't read Roman numerals as well, <laughs> Super Ghouls and Ghosts, Super Mario Kart, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars, didn't Ooh. even know that existed, oh my Super God. Mario World, Super Metroid, and Super Punch-Out, and Yoshi's Island. Legend of the Super that's, that's the original Mario RPG right there. That's what that is one it? is. Yeah, that's one. That that's the entire right. title is the Seven Stars. Yeah, I didn't even know like Legend of the Seven Stars was a thing. Yeah, that was that's that's the Square Enix Mario RPG right there. That one. And oh, right. Oh my God, that's in there. I didn't look at the list because like uh, I'll look at the list and then I forgot to look at the list before this. But for I'll God's sakes, now. this entire list is amazing. Like, okay, uh, there's games that maybe won't like, but. You've got Mario RPG alone is something that people would pay a lot to play. That's an amazing game. You got Kirby Superstar, which is like seven games in one. You've got the Dream Course, which I really enjoy. That's a fun game. F Zero, for God's sakes, F Zero. What could be said? It's F Zero. I just, I just we haven't had F Zero in forever. God dang it! But um, Mario Kart's in there. Oh, who doesn't love Mario? The original Mario Kart. That is a classic! Super Punch-Out and Mega Man X? Yes, Mega Man X, and then you got Street Fighter. Are you kidding me? I... This is something that will sell out so damn fast, and it could make so much money, and yet they don't want to embrace it, and... Nostalgia could be the argument. It's weird. Yeah, they don't want to fully drain the tank. They just want to take a night, you know, take their serving, and then wander off. I... To use, then use that tank quote unquote of nostalgia in say digital games on this in the eShop on the Switch. It's a weird the, uh, the thing argument. though. It's a weird thing though, because they're not even on the freaking the uh, virtual console to buy. Like yep. some of these games, yeah. That is what you hope. It's a permanent it's a permanent backup. They have yeah. a permanent ace in the well proverbial yeah. sleeve. Like and... we always hope for yet. That's the problem. It's the hope for yet. Hope springs eternal, son of a bitch. The mm. balls can only be so blue for so long. But it's Side what note, Nintendo does. Mm. You know this kind of like the well the the regular uh, NES and now the SNES too. How much does this benefit speedrunners? How much will we <laughs> get to see this thing at like the next SGDQ? I, I because would imagine being able to run this stuff in the native ROMs that can open new categories. Yeah, because of course ROMs can have different properties, or this could be a brand new style of emulation. Whatever Nintendo's doing with this. And instead of being able to, all right, 
uh, get the PC, get the emulator set up for the stream. Uh, production, have you got the audio? All right, cool. Uh, you come in. Ah, cr- ah, bugger, it crashed. Instead, just be able to go, all right, uh, Mickey, bring in the emulator. I mean, bring in the SNS Classic. Plug it in. Plug in the HDMI capture. Hi, everyone. Welcome to SGQ. Like, yeah. that kind of easy setup, that's going to be fantastic for old retro speedrunners. Oh, yeah, for sure. So it's uh, going to be interesting how that goes out. Well, they have to get one first. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Bloody Nintendo! Funny, the funny fact about Star Fox 2 was they canceled Star Fox 2 because 64 was coming out. They didn't want to confuse people having two Star Fox games out, and it's finally here. And to its credit, 64 is a treasure. So, like, uh, Star Fox 64... A good decision! Yeah, yeah, I could play that now and not be bored. I really like that game. It's a fun game. It's, it's worth getting. Uh, I think the 3DS is the newest version on that. It's worth getting. It's such a fun game. They just... It's the argument of, though, they knew how to make games back then. No, they know how to make games. It's just limitations have led to some interesting things. But, yeah, I... The nostalgia argument just blows my mind thinking about it. And that's why you talk to people, because you get all these different arguments. And you can think yeah. about things, and it illuminates thoughts. And that is such an interesting argument for nostalgia. I just yeah, think... I am... Like, where I'm coming from, as a side note, you talk about different people. Mm-hmm. I am relatively young. I'm 20 years old. My retro is the PlayStation 1. Huh. And my main, like, growing up console was PlayStation 2 original Xbox. Hmm. So, like... I also would like to be able to do, like, the Netflix of retro to go back and learn. I've never played, like, the original Super Mario, the original Metroid, Mega Man, Kirby's, all that stuff. That's all alien to me. I've only ever seen it. I never played it. Yeah. So, as something you could go back to as well, that'd be super cool. But so far, it's just like, it won't sell. I wouldn't purchase that on nostalgia alone. I'd need it to be easily available and cheap. Yeah. And that is an argument that can be made for... The people who aren't of that of the SNES generation and the NES generation, and are they just scared of that generation not even buying it? I don't, I don't know. It's it's weird. It is just a weird thing, because we clearly saw the NES still had demand, and SNES was far superior to the NES because of course it is the next. It's the super one. So that thing. That console had a lot of amazing games on it, and we're only seeing 20 of them. There's so many more on out there that could be on there. I I could just... Oh. I believe these things have an Ethernet port on them as well, so you could download more games. I really? think. I'm not sure if that's true. I think they have an Ethernet port on them. So Because it's all the same I.O. apart from two changes. The power, and I think an Ethernet cable. Okay. And maybe HDMI. Because it's still the original controller plugins, but there's I don't know there's probably more, a lot more UI in them thinking of because I I was of the mind it was I had to loop that up. But basically, mm-hmm. there's so much potential for them to bring in new stuff as well. What about some old like arcade classics you could bring in, <laughs> and that kind of thing, like old oh. Japan stuff if they can get the licensing for it. Make this thing a place of discovery almost. Like it hey, would be amazing. Random developer, you know that project you like doing in the arcade but couldn't do for the Super Nintendo. Why do you want to make it now? <laughs> well, license it, put it out, you got a brand new audience. Yeah. I I don't know. It's Japan. Japan's weird. That's that's the argument everyone, the, the catch-all everyone gets to use is Japan's weird. Bro, Japan's Japan. weird. <laughs> that's, that's the argument you can make. I just, my thought is nostalgia affecting new games. Because the only thing that it does for me is pedigree, because I know the old games were good. Like, I look at Mario Odyssey, and I'm like, okay, this is going to be really good because... It's, you, understanding the old games, you know it's going to be good, because Mario has not had a stumble as far as it comes to the main Mario games. They're all great. When it comes to Kirby, all I, all I saw was like 20, 30 seconds, like, oh, you can befriend things now, and there's like team combinations and everything. There's like 2D world spinning and yeah. this cute music. And for new players, it's like, if you've never heard of Kirby, it's like, oh, that's a cute thing and all these things. Now, if you're someone who's played them all, like I have, like, knowing the track record, it's going to be great because I know what they can do with Kirby. I know what they've done with Kirby before. Hmm. So I guess nostalgia is you know their track record and you know it's going to be great, but it's, it's not replaced. Like, the new thing doesn't replace the old thing. So I don't know. I... S- I suppose that's a good time to transition to, because we've got about five minutes left, on the, at least for now. We can always extend if need be. 
But it's a good time to talk about the E3 conferences quickly. We'll start with Nintendo, because <laughs> most of my excitement for the Nintendo stuff, apart from Odyssey, mm. which I'm legit excited for, yeah, and also the Mario Rabbids game, because it's XCOM <laughs> Rabbids, what the hell? Yes, yes. But yes, everything of that is excitement by proxy. So, I got excited for Kirby because of your reaction to a couple others. Uh -huh. I got excited for the new Metroid, huh. uh, the Super Metroid 4, because of a couple of my co-commentators' reactions to it. And it's that kind of thing that, um, ne like that Nintendo like to leverage on for their conferences, but they brought a lot of new interesting stuff. Mario Odyssey is so strange. It's <laughs> Mario who's committing war, cr who's committing war crimes <laughs> via mind control, breaking physics, and yet somehow is threatening to already be better than Super Mario Galaxy, just by the trailers. Yeah. The thing about Mario is every new property, when it comes to Mario, it just blows things out. You got, Okay, you got the original Mario, which, like, okay, we could even go as far back as, like, Donkey Kong Mario. Like, it's Jumpman Mario, take on Donkey Kong. Really popular in the arcade, really fun and everything. Then you got the console Nintendo Mario. He's he blows it up in the platformers. Everyone really likes it. It's amazing. Two is very different. People are mixed on that one. Three is really good. People love that one. And then you got Super Mario World. And that thing just blew things up on the Super Nintendo. And then... Uh, was, uh, Super Mario 64? Yeah, I think it's called Super Mario 64, right? 64. And Mario the 64. Bomb, dropped. bomb drops. <laughs> 3D Mario dominates everything. Holy crap. And what comes up? Next after that, you've got yet another big, just very different thing, but they didn't do anything else after, and that was Super Mario Sunshine. Super Mario Sunshine was beautiful, and it was such an interesting usage of water and all that stuff going on there. It was so dang cool, and that blew things up. And then, Galaxy. Galaxy blows things out of the water again! Just, holy crap, with just, you're on planets, you've got this planetary gravity thing going on you still got the straightforward 3d platforming as well just solid platforming all around and then you of course have the wii u ones and they did different innovations there some people they were a galaxy big blast 2, some people which galaxy was 2, of course. pretty renowned every every console has a mario game that blows things out of the water now i would argue if mario maker came out when the wii u launched we'd have a whole different history for the wii u Different timeline. Yeah, because that was the ultimate usage of that console. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. If they came up with that at launch or just the first year, that console would have had a whole different history. Because that mm. got to show you what Nintendo could do with that thing. There was a couple and of things they needed to do, but that definitely would have helped alleviate the bleeding. Because, yeah, yeah that game blew up. Like, you can always less the name too. weird integration of the tablet. Just use the tablet as like a map and a second screen experience. Don't force me to hold it up in front of the computer the TV. Uh, this yeah. is not how I play video games. Yeah. <laughs> like they tried to embrace that. It was like, it was not, it's the wrong embrace. Like the right embrace was used as a tablet. That was definitely the mm. best one to use it. Although using a framing wasn't bad too if you had a TV. Or asynchronous gaming. There were some wonderful things that they would marry a party in a couple other games where mm. you have a couple of people holding controllers yeah. and then the mastermind or the old, like the one versus all holds the tablet. There was some cool things that, and uh, for instance, uh, Jackbox, Jackbox Party Packs, uh -huh. used that thing judiciously because it was so good. And now, of course, I mean, I can do a lot of that with my phone. PlayStation's doing it a lot. They showed that off at their E3 presentation. Yeah. The, the uh, I forget what the name of the experience was called. I think it was PS Now or something? Oh, no, not PS Now, that's the subscription service. It was a proprietary <laughs> thing where they had a bunch of different games almost like a D&D style thing as well, that you just play with your phone linked to the PlayStation. They're embracing a bit more of a board gaming I style. Don't remember it right now, though. Shoot, I watched yeah, the whole thing, I, too. I'll, you probably won't remember much of the Sony thing because it was uh, ju jumping around and audio was <laughs> great. If you watched the Twitch stream, at least. Yeah, apparently and... Twitch dropped the ball. Like, YouTube was apparently oh, perfect, God. Twitch was terrible. I'm like, what? Yeah, it was Twitch, Twitch was uh, on time, but it was horrible. YouTube yeah. was a minute behind. So if you wanted to live tweet, you couldn't do it without spoilers. Mm -hmm. But of course, it was a good stream. But the point being, oh. peripherals can help sell a console. Of course, we saw that with the Wii. We saw that with the PlayStation DualShock to an extent. And then, then the Xbox 360 controller. Like, peripherals can help sell if they're either super good 
super quality or unique. This does not help sell me. Yeah. And then you have that problem that killed THQ, which it was none of those things. None uh, of those things. THQ. Uh, I mean, Dark Side has got out. WWE games got out of that male strum and a couple others, so I'm happy. It sucks that we lost THQ. Yeah. But we got everything got out. Uh, the ones that I cared about got out of it for the most part. Hmm. I I know there's one game that got lost in that whole thing, and I don't remember what it is right now, but I know I Which pre- which presentation? Oh no, I mean THQ when they died. Oh THQ. But um uh, there were so many games that THQ did. It it who the hell came up with doing list. that tablet? Who? Who? Whoever was responsible for that is should just Red not Faction. be allowed to do. Ah. Uh, were well, you thinking of Red Faction? Because that not, was THQ. not Red Faction, but I forgot about them. Yeah. Oh man. THQ Saints Row had good Oprah? stuff. I know Saints Row got changed because what happened. Yeah, Saints Row's alive for the most part. Yeah. But not really sure who got lost because it, it, at this point it's been a couple of years. But whoever Stalker was Stalker was THQ. What? Ooh. I didn't know Stalker was produced by THQ originally. I didn't know that. Dest- oh, I know what it was probably for you. What? Destroy All Humans. That was THQ. That was THQ? Shoot. Okay, th- that was an interesting one. No, that's not it. What? I can't remember. I- I'm dragging us down by not remembering. But... I'm going through the Google list right now for the THQ <laughs> games. Anyway, continue with your original point. What was my original <laughs> point anymore? You were um, talking about the uh, peripherals. Peripherals, yeah. THQ just... Whoever was responsible for that, please tell me they don't do business anymore. Mm. They killed that They'd company. They learned their lesson. They killed that company. Yeah. It's... And uh, on the point of the peripherals, though, we haven't got much time left. Yeah. It, a final point about that. We're seeing something new with the Switch in general. The Switch is almost causing a change in how we play when it comes to playing casually. Like, there were legit tweets just like, don't mind me playing Zelda on a plane. (laughs) Or, don't, you know, hey, I'm playing Splatoon or Mario Kart on, like, the train or something or in the park. And it's, it's not, like, as cheesy as the adverts they show you at Nintendo, like, their dream scenario. But people will just come up to you and say, hey, you playing? Mind if I come play? Yeah. Like, that kind of immediate social grab and port ease of use with the Switch, that is huge. Yeah. Like, one of the best Zeldas ever on a plane or Mario Kart with a bunch of strangers. That is a paradigm shift with the huh. Switch, and it's kind of been low-key. That's always been Nintendo, though. Like, they did that mm. with the Wii. They know how to pull in the casual and the social. Like... I mentioned this in the last podcast with, with, with John, and it was, yes. you see the advertising difference. PlayStation, during E3, they had an ad, and that was, the beaches are empty, nobody's outside, everyone's inside playing. They're all inside mm. playing. And then Nintendo's like, go outside. Meet people. Go outside. Take us with you. Yeah. Play with people outside. Go do Play that. Zelda on an actual mountain, yeah. please. <laughs> They're like, go out. you don't need to be home. Go outside and play, and play with other people. Play at parties. Like, they were very much pushing a different social game. It was very interesting. And Mm. it's just a difference in just how everyone's doing it. And of course, Pokemon Go. (laughs) Walk, for God's sakes, people. Walk. Catch a Pokemon. Catch them outside. It's very funny. Pokemon Go's on having a tiny resurgence because of an update they did to the... I don't play that, but... Every time I know they're having some resurgence. Um, this is turned into a Nintendo podcast. Not on purpose. Not on purpose. Yeah. It's because of the SNES Classic, but we can... There Nin- is... Also, what? Nintendo did have one of the more interesting E3s back on the original topic. It's like, yeah. the biggest E3 takeaways for me were Ubisoft and Nintendo. Now, of course, I'm a Microsoft, I'm a Microsoft ecosystem guy, even though I play a lot of PlayStation in the past, so I, yeah. I adhere to everything. I'm not a straight guy. And of course, gaming PC is with saying... Yeah. Yeah. But Ubisoft with their big genuine announcements of uh, like, hey, here's a Rabbids game. We really want to show you because we like yeah. it. It's almost a Nintendo approach. Yeah. And like, hey, here's Beyond Good and Evil. Here's Ubisoft and Cell, who have had hidden to the corner for 15 years, <laughs> come out and show you it. Or at least show yeah. you a pres- at least show you the trailer of it. Everyone loses their minds. And then Nintendo with the new original stuff, new specifically. You notice as well, on t- back onto the thing you mentioned about the trailers, the weakest part of the Nintendo presentation is when they tried going eSports. Yes. 
Yes. Where they talked about the competition, like yes. the arms tournaments and the Pokemon tournaments. We don't care. Show us your cool and interesting games. Yeah. Go back to the bird on the accordion from Zelda. I love that guy, <laughs> whatever his name was. Go back uh, to him. Oh Stop the esports. It's not like, I'll like dip my tongue in that guy. Yeah. Will he ever see his kids again? Will he ever see his kids again? <laughs> Sad oh accordion. my god. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the esports is... I don't know, it's weird where Nintendo's, like, in the past, but at the same time, they have other things they could do if they really want. Like, they're pushing esports, they don't have to push esports, because they can do other things. But they're pushing it because people want them to do it. It's got money in it, man. It's well, partially... I've seen it everywhere now. It's partially being the beast people think you are, in a way. Like, or they want you to be. People want Nintendo to do esports, so they're pushing it. People want Nintendo to do internet, because they can never do internet. So they're doing it, but it's really weird how they're doing it. You want to know the sick irony about them trying to go esports? They're what? ignoring their one big cash cow. Smash. Nowhere to be seen. Oh. Either Smash Wii U or Smash Switch or the Holy Grail, Smash H Melee HD. <laughs> Smash if, they Melee did, HD. if they went full um. if they went full blown support behind like a, a Melee HD mm. with its own league like Injustice, Street Fighter, and oh. Tekken have now. That would blow everything up. I mean, I know that scene is averse to being known as esports. They are the underground of the underground of the FGC. Uh, but if if Nintendo got full blown behind the melee, or even just Smash in general, but preferably melee, they would gain so many kudos points. It's why you see it spam so much in Twitch chats. Where's melee? Where's yeah. melee HD? Where's melee HD? I I think the thing is the the problem with that is it's also I think Nintendo likes to respect its developers. And what was proven was when the next Smash came after Melee, he's like, I don't like esports, so screw it over. Like, he just, like, the tripping and other things. He's like, no, no, I don't want to be some hardcore esports thing. I want to be a fun that party game. That was Brawl, game. I think, that did yeah, the, uh, brawl, the tripping stuff. So, tr tripping and Brawl, which was annoying. Oh my god. Uh, so, I don't know. It's, it's like esports wasn't really the thing he embraced. And I think he did. Embrace a little bit more with the newest one, with Smash for Wii U and Smash. They did a ranked mode. Videos. That was a big announcement. It was like, "Hey, we got like Final Destination only, guys. Wait, yeah. we're even with the kids." <laughs> it was like, it was like, where's the Fox only mode? Where's the Fox only <laughs> mode? Like, we're almost there. No items. <laughs> you, you you got the three recipes: Final Destination, Fox only, oh. no items. There's the three requirements. High you school. Got one of them. High school for me. Every lunch, every single lunch of high school was Smash sixty four, and then Smash. I think Melee was the second one. So then it was Smash Melee, ah. and so that was every lunch period was just us playing that, and just everyone just being really hardcore about it. And it was always Final Destination. There's like no items, Final Destination. It was always that because everyone just wanted to see who's the better player. And so you see that embraced with every stage has a Final Destination stage. Okay. Okay. I I don't know. I I like the story mode that they took away. I hope they bring that back whenever the Switch one comes out. But, I don't know. Nintendo's weird. That's At the end of the day, Nintendo's weird. The, the one yeah. lesson, the one lesson from today's podcast, Nintendo's weird, get kids. Nintendo's weird. <laughs> When they miss, they whiff horribly, oh. but when they hit, they hit it out of the park. They they really do. It was, there was a huge thing when they did that. But there is one thing I want to talk about before we get out of here, and that was yes. because you are a caster, I want to talk about two things. Maybe three just because. But okay. one is shout casting as part of E3, and yes. one is the Darwin Project. The Darwin Project. I want your thoughts on that one. I really want to hear what your thoughts uh, on that. <laughs> don't force that shit. Okay, uh, if you have to do the corporate get a guy on stage, do what Breakaway did during the Amazon. If you have to bring in respected guys, bring in Sejam, and I think it was not D1, but Boron? I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry I've forgotten your name. But it was Sejam, who's a very respected fighting game commentator, and then another one. To just commentate, do a legit, straight, here's a game, two teams, go. Demonstrate it for us. Show us the potential. Don't do a 30-second clip with no context, with just some dude going 100 miles an hour. Yeah. You, first of all, people hate it when casters go 100 miles an hour, because <laughs> I do that all the time. That's a bad thing I need to cut down, you slow things oh, down. The hype, man. And then there's no context. We still don't know what the Darwin Project is. We know it's a, like, uh, some sort of um, battle royale. Yeah, Side note, powers. why did they present that right next to PUBG? 
Right. You're cutting into your own thing there, Microsoft. That was weird, yeah. Like, PUBG! Like, hey, yeah, here's PUBG, one. biggest biggest game in the world, the biggest battle royale in the world. We really like you. It's an Xbox console exclusive. Here's our own proprietary one to be eaten alive. Yes. Uh, on an <laughs> acting yeah. perspective, though, that was an amazing presentation that guy was doing. It's like, he's God. being that hype, remembering all of his lines, he's going, like, as, as an acting thing, that was impressive. But as a yeah, shoutcasting thing, a it was hustle. so weird. It was so weird. I'm like, what? But what you just said is the other one, and that is Battlefront 2. We had, I can't remember the other ones, all I remember is Golden Boy, because it's Golden Boy. Yep. And so, EA, Battlefront 2... And we get to see two teams go at it, and they're they're doing or the see NBA live, depending on which production feed they went to. <laughs> that was great. Golden Boy blew that off one quite nicely, but oh yeah. god, having that cut in. Yeah, he's like, and here we are watching. Uh, we're watching him dribble. He's he's dribbling pretty well. It's it's quite exciting. This is this is a new feature in in Star Wars Battlefront. Yeah. Apparently, wow. Yes. You can actually <laughs> dribble the Droidicus in the prequels. Just da -da 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 -da. there you go. Yeah. And they're they're covering and everything. And the one thing is, like, I like Golden Boy because I like Golden Boy because, well, we st Smite. Smite, after all. We see Golden Boy at the SWC. Golden Boy's a wonderful person. Yeah, he's a very nice, very nice guy. But when I was watching that thing, I was like, this did not make me enthusiastic, really, for it, with them casting and everything. Yeah. It, one problem is it just looks like it's just one with DLC. But the other thing was, is, there's a point where there's, like, a player named Muselek or something like that. Muselk. Muselk. Kids eating shit on buildings. <laughs> yeah, he's just dying constantly. But we hear Golden Boy say, wait for him later on, we're gonna see him go crazy. I'm like, wait, is this pre- is this- are you- are you doing this in post? Uh, is this in the script? I mean, we joke about scripts all the time, but this is, is actually it? scripted. Yeah, I was like, wait, what? Because he mentions, like, wait until later on, he's gonna go crazy. I'm like, wait a second here. They probably have, like, a dev hack or something like, okay, because, I mean, they even joked about it at the beginning, oh. when they introduced Battlefront 2. They had they brought in the game changers, <laughs> and the game which are essentially a bunch of just streamers and influencers coming in to help out advise on the game. Yeah, and they re they oh. did like, hey, here's us shooting and acting in game for the multiplayer trailer, the one where it's like, okay, area's clear, Darth Maul, not clear, not clear. That one, <laughs> if you remember that trailer. Yeah, and they joke about it, and I feel they probably could have presented it better. Well, this is my opinion. Get rid of I Justine. I know why she's there. She's there because she's a one, a woman. She looks pretty, always nice to look at, keeps your attention. I'm sorry, but that is a legit that, reason. That's People where we will get in women now. for that. And yeah, and that <laughs> is a legit reason why. Mm. And two, she has a lot of pull, so you'll want to actually watch because she's popular. Cut her out of the picture. Just have Golden Boy and the head dev. Golden Boy hypes it up and leads the conversation, and then have the developer sell you on it. Talk about like the new heroes. The they didn't talk once about the cool system they're using. Like I can sell the game better than Dev can. Then they've got this new system in it now, where instead of doing power ups on the map, the floating ones, if you remember, they just randomly like, oh, I want to play as Darth Vader. I've got to go find the power up and compete with fifty others to get it. It's on a point system now. Yeah. The points you earn, you can spend them on a vehicle or a super battle droid. Watch out for those wrist rockets, that kind of thing, or a hero. Like, that is an extremely important thing to mention, but they leave it out entirely. Yeah, I like, have the... They said it in passing. I know I heard the word points at some point. That's it. But, yeah. Mm. I, golden Boy is a golden boy. He knows what he's doing. He's pretty good at it. And I, I agree with you. It, if it was just him and the dev, it probably would have been a very much more informative thing than it was. You can have it hype and in, uh, you can sell you on it and also be hype at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a skill he has. And it's pretty good. And the last one is just, in general, influencers. Uh, Need for Speed, Jesse Wells. The Creator Cave! Creator Cave, and just Jesse Wells. A guy, guy's from Prank vs. Prank. And he's like, uh, hey, I'm here for Need for Speed 3, or yeah, Need for Speed whatever. He, either he didn't rehearse, or was a hangover, or something bad happened yeah. in production that threw him off. Mm -hmm. Because, and then, oh. And then one of the producers comes up and is like, oh, thank you for saving. Oh, he's going to talk some more? No, no, stop. I just, E3 was, it was, as a person. It was weird. As a person who's doing these things, like we're being, trying to be an influencer and all that stuff and seeing them embrace influence. Yeah, sure. But at the same time, it felt very pandery and 
it it is why people did not like E three L that much. I I mean EA's E three L that much. It was just yeah played weird. It was not sports and ungenuineness. Oh yeah, and it just wasn't great. What's the one thing you remember from the E three presentation? I guarantee it's the exact same thing as me. Uh, from say EA's? it on, right, say it on three from EA, from EA's presence. Say okay. it, say the thing on three. Okay, okay. One, two, three. Oh, Prison Break out. game. Pri- yep. Oh yeah. Yep. Prison Break game. Yes. Way out. Because it was genuine. Yes. Well, they 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 had the overexcited indie devs instead of the scared one this time. But it <laughs> was still it was a Cage unique game. Dev. Yeah. And it oh. was you know it was unique. It wasn't pandery. It wasn't sports. It was just a cool game. Give us a gameplay demonstration. Move on. Yeah, and that was great. And yeah, he was very confident. Uh, people compare him to David Cage. He's just a very confident indie dev. And was like, yeah, he came out with Brothers. Like that was a very good game. That'll give you confidence. That was a really good game. And he's getting backed by E3. He's like, I mean, by EA. That's going to give you some some pull right there. That's the moment of EA. The moment of Xbox. I can't even. I don't even remember Xbox right now. It's just games, I've got, games, and I've games. I've got a few. Mm-hmm. Sea of Thieves to me was pretty big Ooh. because one, I play a lot of Sea of Thieves in the closed technical test to do right now. It's NDA, oh, nice. so I can't actually talk yeah. about it. But yeah, it, it's it's good. Trust me, it's good. Oh, okay, good. And Just... yeah, can't say more. Right. It's good. And and they, what else was there? There was specifically well, one not the Porsche. The whole <laughs> idea of the God, yeah. Here's a look. At, where's the guy? Where's the one Porsche dev who looks like he actually wants to have sex with the car? He came from like the 2014 presentation. It was awesome. It was like, look oh at this leather. Oh my god. The, the there was a big thing with Crackdown with Terry Crews. Oh, it's like, Terry yeah, Cruz. Terry Crews and Crackdown. It's like peanut yes. butter and jelly. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. Then the uh, Dragon Ball presentation, Dragon oh. Ball Fighters. That was pretty hype. Yes, like, very much. Oh, hey, guess what? Marvel vs. Infinite's dropping the ball. Let's just have Guilty Gear swing themselves <laughs> in. Here's Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, oh. which is all- oh, sorry. Here's Marvel vs. Capcom Three, which is already insane. But let's put Dragon Ball in it. Yeah, because why not? Oh, it, oh it's uh, Guilty Gear. Guilty Gear. Yeah. Guilty Gear Dragon Ball. Yeah. Arc well, System makes it. Yeah, Arc System, while as, yeah, Infinite just looks so bad. Not, not the best, not the best presentation you Literally can do. and metaphorically, Chun-Li's face. <laughs> oh, man. What happened? They didn't put the gear out the oven Chris like, Redfield, long enough. <laughs> Chris Redfield, Dante, like Chris... Chris looked half decent. Wait, so Chris Redfield was the one that made you speak up, not like Captain America or Chun Li. Oh, ca- oh, Captain America, the Rob Life Liefeld, uh, Captain America. Yes, my Rob God, Liefeld. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. If you don't know what that is, kids, look that up right now, please. <laughs> you have to. You have to. But yeah, Marvel is dropping the ball. It, apparently, in gameplay, oh, it's awesome. Good, because it's supposed in to be. But looks, but... it's <laughs> that way. But yeah, that Microsoft, the Scorpio, or rather the Xbox One X. Oh my god, topic. that stupid title. It's Wii U all over again? Yeah. Or, or To be fair, there's a clever thing with stores. Stores will love the acronym, because... Will they? X- like... B- XB1X. Yeah. Yeah. What's the acronym? Xbox. I want the Xbox. Dead simple. Wait, which Xbox? The, the original, the 360, the S, or the X? That's... Oh, by the way, there's the Xbox S and the Xbox X. Do not have yeah. an accent. Do not have an accent, parents. That's going to be a problem. <laughs> yes, I'd like the Xbox intercourse, please. Oh, God. And it's <laughs> also, as well, still the same problem we you had. So, it's like, there's a letter on it, so uh, parents will not know the difference. And that's going to be a problem. No, the difference with the price. That thing is expensive. Or they'll think it's a cheaper but, deal. But there is some advantages with the price, because... Xbox already has a huge kip up on Sony. They lost in the time war, they're losing in the price war, but they're beating Sony at their own technology. The thing is, the cheapest 4K UHD player on the market. And Sony owns that technology. The PlayStation doesn't play 4K UHDs, the Xbox One X does. What? What? That's PlayStation. Xbox is doing to you what you were doing to them yeah. back on the PS2. Yes. The PS2 was the cheapest DVD player on the market. And now the Xbox One X is going to be the cheapest 4K player on the market. What are you doing? I didn't even realize that angle. Oh my god, yeah, what? 
What? What, what are you? That alone <laughs> would be a reason to get it just for the price. But then it's actually it's an Xbox One X that has games. They're angling it as an entertainment center, and it's yeah, working now. They, they always do that, but they did it in a better way because they threw games at us this time instead of just here's a lot of TV. Oh god, the TV uh, for when the Xbox One was originally done, the one guide stuff. Oh, uh, notice how they didn't mention the Hololens at all. Yeah, it's like, hey, we can mess with Minecraft with it with the Hololens. Minecraft in 4K now, though. That's the new <laughs> oh, gimmick. Oh god, the hey, joke this is, is real. We've had for years on PC. <laughs> the joke is real. The joke is real. Yes. And crossplay. I'm excited for crossplay. Because yes. I have Minecraft viewers. Like, I have viewers that have Minecraft that have it on console and not on PC. So I can play with them now. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Ori and... in the Blind Forest. I haven't <laughs> played it. Still makes me cry. Oh my god. Oh, how do you play it? They got the composer it? on stage. That was fantastic. Oh my god. It's so beautiful. It's so, it's so beautiful. The owl. Oh. The sad owl. The sad owl. It's like. David Cage asks, can a game make you cry? Yes, David Cage! Yes, it can! But it's not by you. It is by Ori. Yeah. Ori in the Blind Forest. Yeah. yeah, E3 was spotty in places. If we had to give uh. it, like, a one-word review, look at Ubisoft, all of it. Look at all of the Nintendo stuff, and then just, like, find reaction videos to the Sony and Xbox and the PC gaming show oh, ones. Oh, God. Like, I, I like the PC one, actually. They, they threw a lot of interesting games out. Yes. XCOM expansion. Yes. Holy shit. Getting that. That looks really good. Mm hmm Like, oh my god. And, oh. Okay, we're going over. Screw this. Um. Yeah, why not? Let's go over. XCOM. <laughs> Sorry, Jake, did you're editing. XCOM. To, uh, she's having a note. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jigs. XCOM 2. The expansion. Like, you get three factions you have to please. Like, there's gonna be, there's gonna, everyone's like, zombies. Like, no, no, no. Zombies, guys. You can there's, take advantage of them. There's five factions, them. technically. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. There's. Yeah, so there's, there's the three human factions you've got yeah. to stop having a fight, which each of them give you a super unit. That's awesome. Then there's the Chosen, which are essentially is an expansion to the Alien Hunter DLC, which with three mega enemies to fight that yeah. are persistent. And then there's the zombies. Yes. Which are now in play. And which you can you can use them to your advantage, which is And they will also awesome. fight you. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, don't be too close, but have them get too close. Four-way XCOM fights. I can barely <laughs> cope with two. Oh like, my god, oh. I I love the potential. Like, that is straight up going to be something we're going to see on the channel. There's no way we're not going to. It's such a cool potential right there. The other thing mm. about E3 is October, say goodbye to your income. Everything comes oh. out in freaking October. Shadow War comes out, yep. Bruise. Bruise was, just stole the show. Bruise the chopper! <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, as douche, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the ogrin who died in the original reveal, you have been replaced with a new bay. Oh my god. Bruce the Chopper. Yeah. Oh. Just, yeah, he died after all. Bruce isn't dead, so, uh, if, if all the characters have a, a little bit of Bruce's charm, like they have their own charm like him, oh, it's out He's gonna the be park. the, he, no, he, no, he, I imagine Bruce is gonna be the rat gut, or whatever okay, his name was, but a better of version this game. of rat gut. If, if he is yes. an actual character... I'm fine with that. Ratbag. Ratbag, there Rat we go. Ratbag was okay, but Bruise is amazing. If Bruise is a character with you, kill him in the final mission, and that is going to be the most amazing Oh, he betrays punch. you. Oh. oh. And you slap him down and put him back on your team. But <laughs> I will feel offended if he ends up getting scarred by something. I will feel oh, personally offended. Yeah. Bruise is your boy. He is your boy in that game. Like, I, that's what I'm looking forward to is the Nemesis system. Yes. Developing relationships with your Oryx and just like, this is your guy. And if he gets killed, you will tear Mordor asunder for whoever killed him. Like, it's gonna mm. happen. I'm excited for that. You'll find a way. Necromancer tribe. <laughs> Resurrect this dude or I'm flaying oh, you alive. Yes. I, I'm so excited for that. And then you've got Wolfenstein coming up. And then South Park's the also there. This conference was weak as hell. I, I, it was an interesting argument for why. And the conference was weak because they made a freaking Disneyland at the actual thing. Like wait, each, really? Each land had its own drink and food. Like, wait, wait, they actually had a full. You're serious? Yeah, they had they had a full. I thing. didn't know about this. Yeah, this is the thing that I I did not know about until later is they had a each they had a land for each one. Like after they announced the Evil Within thing, they had like a little hotel for it, and on the wall was appreciate art, and they had like these kind of like blood drinks. And they had food there. So, like, Skyrim had food and drink. I think they had, like, a mead. And each place had food and drink. 
The Wolfenstein one was that diner you saw in the trailer. Strawberry milkshake, I assume, right, for the trailer? That is so cool. So they actually had things on site instead of the presentation. And so understanding that, okay, that's cool. But yeah, the presentation itself was weak. But that was, it's It's so interesting. What were the biggest talking points, right, Scarf? There was... The new Wolfenstein. The new, the new games. And yeah, well, the, the VR stuff, and okay. VR. We've seen Skyrim VR at Millington. <laughs> Skyrim being re-released for the, the bajillionth time. <laughs> and the whole Creation Club, which isn't paid mods. Let talk. me emphasize that isn't paid mods, <laughs> but the way they presented it. They, what they should have done is, they should have made, like, hey, we're doing a thing called Creation Club. We're going to put a video up on YouTube after the conference. It's going to be, like, 45 minutes long detailing how this works the yeah. way they only had two minutes sting for, for it around about right scott yeah, yeah. to explain what creation club, bit, that yeah. looked like paid mods in that two minute sting mm. they could have taken the time to to put in more on that for sure they could have i guess they didn't want to slow it down but the whole thing was slow anyway so they could have slowed it down by explaining that that is a good that is a that is definitely a criticism for sure until the wheelchair murder <laughs> <laughs> i love that bit. oh man it's yeah, hearing all the arguments for it, I'm on the side of, yeah, this is a good thing, not that it's a bad thing. I, I'm on that side of it. And, okay, so let's wrap up, and this is why you're going to come back in the future anyway, because there's always something to talk about, like, um... Yeah. Uh, when, when you get creators together and people who love what they do, they're going to talk forever, and that's what's happening <laughs> here right now, so... Let us, uh, end it up, and the way I want to end it is a lesson you have learned... Uh, from your casting and everything, because I think we're all in this thing, we have more experience than anyone who hasn't done it yet, so what is a lesson you've learned that someone who wants to consider it would find useful? One, there's a lot of lessons you can take, but one lesson I can say for commentary is, you're going to fail, it's going to sound cringy, (laughs) but find your niche and stick with it, and drill into it. There's two chairs, you either are play-by-play or color. Uh Find the chair, Sit down, put a seatbelt on, strap yourself in, and don't move. Specialize. You you are, you are not going to be able to just talk like this. Like, casting is different to a podcast. Yeah. It's more formal. You can't expect to just go in and feel like you're just having a chat with someone, because there's a, it's a lot more rigorous. It takes a lot of practice, and expect to fail. Ooh. Yep. Uh, those who don't know how me and Verb came together, it was us both doing shout, uh, shoutcasting Smite for Smite. Scrims. Smite Scrims. My first time That's on... That's how we found Kylax as well. Oh, yes. Kylax and just so many people. First time on, I'm going hype, man, and I'm just going, I'm going, going, and my mic was set to max. It blew everyone's ears out. It was amazing. Whoops! Yeah. Whoops! I was like, hey, guys, it's middle scrims! You were much better as an analytical <laughs> commentator than a, than a, oh. than a play-by-play, because yeah. you ended up running out of breath halfway through. Yeah, it's, oh my god, and I, I took flashcards, memorized all the abilities and everything and all that stuff, and it was interesting doing that, and it was fun. It's fun, it's fun commenting, and it is a thing, and you run out of breath, or you run out of just being able, you run out of saliva real quick. Train of that. thought. Oh, you train that. of thought. You just start talking nonsense if you can't think fast enough, which is so easy to go into. Yeah, and then just trying to get the names and... Freaking Bart being allowed to just say whatever he wants for the names of the abilities. <laughs> but, when when um, you were that good, you had so much luxury. Yeah. So, there you go. That is basically a podcast. So, where can we find... Uh, what are you doing as far as uh, where they can see the, the For Honor and the Smite stuff? Yes. Well, most of my stuff right now is Smite-related. I am working with eSports Anchor, streaming the Southeast Asian Invitational League, basically Southeast Asian SPL on high res TV every Thursday and Friday at around 2 p.m. or sorry, 1 p.m. British time. And I don't know what the conversion is for everyone else. So just look up 2 p.m. British time converted because I'm lazy. When I'm sleeping, and now there we go. Do- there you go. <laughs> when I'm sleeping, there you go. It, that would be 6 a.m. 6 a.m. It'd be 6 a.m. PST, so 9 a.m. EST. Yes. So... If if you get up for work at that time, get your cup of joe and listen to verbal yell about a thing. There you go. <laughs> yeah, about Asians that. doing stupid things. Yeah, about Michael, Asians. Do that. Yes. Yelling at Asians, always a fun pastime for me. Okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh, wow. God. <laughs> <laughs> you can find, of course, you on Twitter. 
It, it's very velocity right on Twitter, right? Yeah. Universal branding is a wonderful thing. I got much more lucky than you in that regard. Yes, unfortunately. And as always, if anyone has any notes and feedback for the podcast, let us know. Jinx's note is don't go over an hour, damn it. Um, <laughs> it's gonna happen. But, Put a puppy um, face over me as an apology or something. <laughs> uh, like, if anyone has thoughts on format. I like the way it is right now, where we have things we want to talk about. Like, it starts with introduction, we talk about whatever we want to talk about, and then it ends on a lesson. I think those are the best ways to go about it. For me. Yes. But uh, opinions on whatever everyone's got. Uh, let us know. We won't, uh, we'll listen to everyone. Doesn't mean we'll take everyone's advice at the end of the day, but it's important to have different opinions and thoughts so we can think about what we want to do. So there you go. That is right there it is basically a podcast with Verbalocity. I had fun talking. Hope you had fun watching and listening. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Having fun. Thanks for coming by and see you next time. Bye. <laughs> we do it every time. <laughs>